Praise God. If we could this morning, those of you that are here, why don't you help me this morning? Why don't you just close your eyes, lift your hands right where you are. I don't want you to ask the Lord to talk to you today. I want you to ask the Lord to challenge you today. I want you to ask the Lord to open up your, your ears, your eyes, your heart. Don't let me just pray it. It don't do any good if I pray it. you got to pray it. Lord, challenge me today. Let me see something differently today than I've seen before. Let me, let me, let me understand something about you I've never understood before. Let the spirit of revelation be loosed in this place, Father. In the name of Jesus, I speak these things in Jesus' name. I speak them in Jesus' name. We speak your presence to be made manifest in this place. As your word is taught, Lord, let there be a spirit of revelation that rests on us. In the name of Jesus, we speak it now. Praise God. Praise God. Would you clap your hands to the Lord? Let's give him a hand clap of praise. Praise God. Just to kind of give you a little update, and I know it's only, there's more that are coming in. We may have to, I'll, I'll may have to repeat this again, uh, but just in the beginning, uh, it appears that uh, we're sort of mapping out a couple of things here, and um, we've got one uh, Sunday, this is the last Sunday of August. Uh, next Sunday is obviously Labor Day weekend, and I know some of you will not be here, uh, but we're going to continue with the Anatomy of a Disciple, and then uh, we're going to tie up all the loose ends um, through the month of September, and we will be finished with the Anatomy of a Disciple uh, series at the end of the month of September, uh, and uh, not that we're finishing the 945. So again, 945, originally people started calling it UTB, now they're calling it Anatomy of a Disciple. Those are just the series that we're doing uh, at, in the morning. Those are not what the morning is about. This is really just a, an hour of discipleship teaching. It's an hour for those that want to become disciples to come and to be taught. And uh, you're already coming on Sunday morning, so coming here a little earlier uh, is a lot less of a sacrifice than taking up another night of the week. But it looks like in October, we're going to do a brand new series for the month of October. And we're working on that right now. And uh, we're going to take sort of this vein of the anatomy of a disciple, uh, but we're going to take it from a different approach and, um, and look at some things uh, as we've sort of hit some high points. A couple weeks ago, we talked about discerning good and evil. We talked about some things, uh, what does the Bible say is good and evil? What does the Bible say uh, that not everything is black and white? We thought for a long time that everything in the scripture should be black and white. So people say, well, what am I supposed to do? That's not in the Word of God. Uh, or the Bible doesn't say, why doesn't God come out and just say, don't do this? Why doesn't God come out and just say, don't do that? Because the Bible's not black and white. And the reason why the Bible's not black and white is the Bible was not written for a specific time period. The Bible was written because it's the Word of God, and God dwells in all space and all time. The but Word of God was written to span all space, all time, all cultures, all people, all languages. And so a lot of times, you'll find that the Bible isn't black and white for a reason. Because if it's black and white, it will end up eliminating some because black and white will pertain to one culture over another. I, I saw this the other day online and um, found out it's amazing today in the modern world we live in that this stuff still takes place. Uh, with all the technology and all the advances we made. But there was a group of scientists, and uh, there's a, there is a, um, a, an agency in the country of Brazil that is responsible for the preservation of indigenous people. I believe that's what they're called, the agency. And one of the things they do is they try to preserve uh, the culture of the Amazonian people that have dwelled in the jungles of the Amazon for uh, generations and generations and literally probably going back thousands of years. Uh, and they did some uh, new research and some new exploration. And it's, it's crazy to think in the world with, with uh, technology and satellites and space travel and all the stuff that we've got that still there are some uncharted, unexplored places on this earth. And so... They did some 
uh, new exploration in the Amazonian region and got to some places that are not accessible uh, by anything but foot. And to say by foot uh, literally means that every step you take requires removal and hacking and uh, macheteing of material. So it's not exactly like there's a path going from. And they took a drone with them. I'm, I'm trying to make a point. I'm taking, I'm, they took a drone with them. And they got to an area unexplored. Instead of trying to figure their way through, they let the drone do the work. And of all things they could have discovered, they discovered a new group of people, a new tribe that the rumors that they existed, but no one had ever confirmed this, they discovered a new tribe in the Amazon region that has not been touched by the outside world. 2018, it's amazing to think that. 2018, there are people that are not. So let's take that group of people. If you and I somehow had the ability to parachute in and take to them the gospel, the gospel was not written to Americans. Contrary to our patriotic beliefs, the gospel wasn't written to Americans. And so if everything in the gospel is black and white, and everything about the Bible is black and white, then when you presented the gospel to them in their culture and their attitude, and they don't even know what a cell phone is, they have no ability, they have no, no recollection and understanding of world history, wars have been fought, Millions of people have died, and that, that pocket of humanity knows nothing of that. But here's the powerful part about the Bible. The Bible still works. The Bible would work for that people just as much as it works for us. So that's why the Bible is not all black and white. That's why the Bible does have gray. Not gray so that we can make up our own rules. Because gray so that we can abide by the principles. And the principles work in every single situation. Every culture. Every background. Every diversity. God is not having a set of rules for you. A set of rules for me based off my skin color, my ethnicity, my culture, our nationality. There's not an American gospel. There's not a, a, a Chinese gospel. There's not a Spanish gospel. It is just the gospel. And so uh, saying all that, we're going to go through and take sort of that idea in its foundation. That's sort of a very rudimentary way of looking at it. We're going to sort of take that idea and talk about sort of God's viewpoint and how God sees things. Uh, it's very hard. I'm, I'm learning this more and more. The more I study the Word of God, the more I try to challenge my own self to dig deeper. It is very difficult to go to the Word of God and not have it filtered through what we've been told or what we've been thought, or just simply to be filtered through our own experiences, Brother Nielsen. It's very hard. It's, we all interpret the Word of God through our own hurt, through our own upbringing, our own. It's very difficult to come to the Word of God with a blank slate. Very difficult. And so uh, I've been challenging myself in some areas just to, just to challenge myself and look at some things. So we're going to take that idea, and I'm, I'm taking a moment here not to uh, belabor the details. We're going to take sort of that idea, and in the month of October, we're going to build on it uh, going forward. So... Uh, the, the, the um, landing strip is, is uh, in view for the anatomy of a disciple here on Sunday mornings. Uh, we're going to do this through the end of September. Uh, so we got about, what's, uh, four weeks, five weeks left uh, of anatomy of a disciple. We're, gonna, we're going to start tying up the loose ends on the outer ring. And then we're going to start talking about sort of how everything is connected. And uh, I've, I have... Uh, been challenged by this series, but also too, uh, I have to, I have to help, I have to be honest with you. It's changed the way I've thought. It's changed the way I think, and so um, I don't believe this was just something that was just to take up time on Sunday morning. I believe this is foundational to where God is uh, going to be taking us. So let's get into it today. We are uh, going to move 
to the, if you're looking at the chart today, uh, we're, we're moving to the outer ring. We've talked about being humbly submitted, which is the, the first place that we start. We talk about being biblically formed, which forms the core of who we are, our mind and our, our heart and our mind working together and talking about the balance that's needed to have a heart that's submitted and a mind that's biblically formed. And then the last three weeks, or actually not been the last three weeks, it's been about five weeks, we've been uh, kind of going through uh, the, the ring of choice, which deals with our desires, our wills, and our um, character. And that dealt with us being uh, generous with our time, talent, and treasure. That talked about us being relationally healthy, how we interact with people, what that is for us and for them. And then we also talked about being morally discerning. So now we're going to move one step further today. We're going to get to the outer ring, and the outer ring is the ring of compassion. If you got one of those little circles uh, earlier during the series, uh, you'll notice that the circle, this is the ring of compassion. And compassion is simply this. Compassion is how we interact with the world around us. This is, the, this is the part of the, of the, it's the part of us that the world sees. In fact, we don't even really know our own heart. That's what the, the Bible says, is that man doesn't even know his own heart. Only God knows. And so we move forward in all this. Uh, this is where sort of the rubber meets the road. And we've built on layer by layer. We've, we've, we've established a very solid foundation. We've built layer by layer on this. And so now we're getting to the point where this is, this is how we uh, go from being the disciple to being a disciple maker. And these, this is the ring that's going to determine that. We first must be a disciple so that we can be a disciple maker. I cannot give something to someone, something to someone I don't first have. What did Peter, uh, Peter say? He said, silver and gold have we none, but such as we have, give I you. He gave what he had. You cannot give something to somebody unless you first have it. You can't, you can't help somebody love Jesus if you don't first love Jesus. Come on, we, we live in a world now where it's very easy to see people that, I mean, we live in a world that nothing is real anymore. Photoshop has completely destroyed reality. Seriously. And nowadays it's so bad, they actually have to put on a picture unedited. Because everything has been retouched and untouched and double-touched and triple-touched and tucked in here and, and moved here and smoothed here and colored here and so we live in a world that has distorted true reality. But we are supposed to and be called to be true, authentic disciples. This is not a, an act that we play. We are, we, this is who we are. And so let's talk for this uh, uh, for a few minutes. The, the compassion is the outer ring of our, my life change. And usually compassions are the least developed, giving that there's a natural progression of life change from the inside out. Notice, God works from the inside out. God works from the inside out. Turn to your neighbor and tell them that to remind them that. Say, God works from the inside out. But here's the deal. Even though God works from the inside out, this outer ring is the place that's most notable by the world around you. And realizing that others see these parts of your life and make judgments about you, it sometimes forces us to do the old look like a Christian, act like a Christian, but really not be one. If you're going to fake it, usually this is where you fake it. Because this is the place where people are going to judge you, and usually this is where you're going to do your best acting job. However, God's design is for your actions to follow the submitted heart and the biblically formed mind, that your choices can be in line with Him so that you have genuine compassion for the lost and lonely people of this world 
like he had compassion. How many times, if you ever read the gospel, if you've never read the gospel, I encourage you to read it. They're fascinating books. But if you ever read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, how many times did it use the phrase, and he was moved with compassion? i got to be honest with you, and this is not, n- not to be a negative statement. It's just a statement of observation. Do you know why I feel like we struggle reaching our world? It's because we really don't love the people around us. We don't love the people around us. We love ourselves. We love our church friends. But we don't really love the people around us. We tolerate them. And usually when we interact with them, we interact with them in a way that we want to try to get them to church, not so that they can experience God, so that others can see us bring somebody to church, so that we can elevate our own status. We can elevate because we can walk in and say, look who I I brought people today. That gives me status. Not that the fact that I love this person, because you see, if I love them, I see beyond their appearance. I see beyond their lifestyle. Hello, somebody. I see beyond the junk of their life. I see beyond their shortcomings, and I see the person that's on the inside that's broken, that's hurting, that needs Jesus. I'm not stepping across the other side of the street to avoid those around me because I'm judging them by what I appear that's going on in their life, but because I have genuine compassion, I'm allowing the Holy Ghost to peel back that, that, that facade and actually see that inside there's a hurting person. I'm not here to pick out a spe- a specific group, but it's just, it's a good one. It's not as bad today, but when I was, when I was a teenager, that was a big group, not as much today, but you'd go to the mall and you'd see the group walking down the mall, black trench coats, spiked hair, chains, things attached to things that should not be attached. And the thing that I thought was, my goodness, let me get out away from them. But if you would look at those people like Jesus looked at that people, you would not see people that look like they're up to no good, but you would see that anyone that's doing that is crying out for help. So we've got to love people because Jesus loved people. He was moved with compassion. But let's step back for a moment. Let's go all the way back to the beginning and look at this again. To understand God's overall plan for development of your compassions, we need to step back and see this That's not a recent design that God has. It started in the very beginning. Let's go back to the very beginning. We talked about this all the way back. I believe it was in the first or second week of this series. Genesis 1 verse 26. Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them rule over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the sky, over the cattle and all over the earth, every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and God said, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Don't forget, when we say the word God created man in his own image, the word image is translated idol. Usually the word there, image, is translated idol, which means this. An idol depicts a physical representation of a greater reality. Let me repeat that again. An idol depicts a physical representation of a greater reality. That is to say this. Who God designed mankind to be was a physical, tangible, visible representation of Him, the greater invisible reality. That means that you and I are not just walking the face of the earth just trying to make it to heaven. The mentality that I'm just holding on, I'm going to hunker down, I'm going to get my can of green beans, my can of beans, and all my other non-perishable foods, my bottles of water, get me a bunker, and hunker down until Jesus comes, is not the design God had. Because God designed you and I to be the physical manifestation and the tangible manifestation of an invisible God. I wonder what would change in our life. I'm going to ask myself this question. I wonder what would change in Joel Rice's life if I walked around everywhere I went 
with the attitude that when they see me, they see Jesus. How would your actions change? See, we don't want to talk about that because that sort of starts getting down in our life. Says so Owens, I don't like that because that's okay when we come to church. But don't start messing with my personal life, preacher. That's my life. That's my time. Those are my things I'd like to do. Well, if that's your attitude today, you need to go back to the very center circle there because you don't have a heart that's submitted. Because ultimately, to know that what now, listen, i got to be honest with you, that's a lot, it, it, if, if you allow it, and maybe you're not like this, I'll just use me for a sin, if you allow yourself to think that way, it puts a lot of pressure on you, because i got to be honest with you, when someone cuts me off in traffic, my first instinct is like, I'm, I'm Jesus' representative, Jesus' representative. I want to send them to see Jesus. So let's not get the idea that, that God is asking us to walk around perfect. If he wanted us to do that when you got baptized, it would have melted the flesh off you and you'd have come out a glorified being. But because when you came out of that water, you still had flesh, proves that God is not asking you to be perfect. And if God's not asking you to be perfect, stop respecting everybody around you to be perfect. Can I just throw that in there? If God hasn't asked you to be perfect, don't expect people around you to be perfect. That's free today. So if we understand that part one of God's plan was for us to be his representative, you and I to be his representative, then if we go a little farther, we find in Genesis chapter 11 where we find the whole story with the Tower of Babel and God divided the world into nations. When he broke the world into nations, he took a people... And began to develop a new nation in the midst of all of the nations through which he would show other nations what he was like compared to their gods. If we go back to the beginning, to the one man, Abraham, notice the words to this man living in this desert city. Genesis 12, verse 1. Go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great, so you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I'm the ones who curse you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. If you look at that, you notice God promised he would make Abraham a great nation. In the midst of all of the nations created just a chapter earlier, in verse chapter 11, he promised that through this nation all other families of the world would be blessed. So the nation of Israel was going to become the shining illustration and the picture of what God was like to the rest of the world. We can find that a little later on because when this nation was finally born, they were in Egypt, and we know the whole story of captivity in Egypt. And they come out of Egypt uh, led by Moses, and uh, they have this whole situation that takes place. Finally, they cross over into the promised land. They arrive at Jericho uh, after 40 years of wandering around, and we know the story of what begins to take place in the city of Jericho. But the interesting part about that is what Rahab said in Joshua chapter 2, verse number 8. Let's read that for a second. Now before they lay down, she came up upon the roof and said to them, I know that the Lord has given you the land. That's a whole... But you could preach for an hour on that. Here's a woman who is living in a walled city. But the people of God and what God was doing was so great that even she and those in the city recognized. She said, we know God has given you the land and that the terror of you has fallen on us and that all the inhabitants of the land have melted away from you. For we have heard now the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites on beyond the Jordan you whom you utterly destroyed. When we heard it, our hearts melted and no courage remained in any man any longer because of you. For the Lord your God, He is God in heaven above and on earth beneath. Do you realize what that means just for you and I? I know we're, 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 we're talking about one, but can I stop and say one? When God does things in your life 
and God manifests himself in your life that you become a walking, breathing testimony and the representation of the power of God to those around you. That's why you don't have to know Genesis to Revelation and all the ins and outs. But if you just tell the things that God has done for you, those things alone can impact those around you. And she said, we've heard about all this stuff that's happened. So look at this. Other nations saw and recognized that there was one true God as he worked in and through the nation of Israel. So the nation of Israel, in many ways, was a physical, tangible representation of the invisible God. In fact, if we go further and we go in the New Testament, Jesus said this to his Jewish audience, Matthew chapter 5, verse 14. He says, you are the light of the world. A city set on the hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and gives light to all the house in the same way. Let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. Do you know what that means? The Bible says, I was not designed to be the tail, but the head. That means we, as the children of God, the people of God, should be the most blessed on the job. We who are the children of God should be the people that have the most peace and they're the happiest on the job. We shouldn't be like everybody else around us. Why? Because we've got something they don't have. This whole attitude, and it's kind of crept into us, that if you're a believer, you should somehow be pious and depressed and walking around, well, you know, I just, I'm, I, I go to church on Sundays, and I just, I can't do this, and I can't do that, and my life is so boring. That is completely opposite of what God said. He said, you're a light. Don't light, hide that light under the bush. Put that light on a lampstand. Let the whole world see. When I walk around, I should walk around proud of who I am. Not ashamed or afraid. We're so afraid of people rejecting us. Let's be honest. We're so afraid people are going to reject us that we automatically assume they're going to reject us. Now, that doesn't mean you come out and you tell somebody, you know what, they probably are going to reject you if you come out to them and say, listen, uh, if you're not saved, you're going to hell. Just letting you know that. They are going to probably reject you. But if you're who God's called you to be, and you walk around knowing you're confident, not who you are, but in who Jesus called you to be. Bro, brother, uh, they, they were all giving me a hard time when we walked in today. Because as you can notice this morning, I'm trying to blend in. <laughs> so they were all giving me a hard time this morning about my uh, uh, attire. Brother, brother Eng Englum, though, paid me the highest compliment. And I see if I can get it correctly here, uh, John, if, I, if you can help me. But basically, the gist of it was, it's an awesome thing when you don't really care about people's opinion. I say, yes, it is, baby. Do you know how liberating it is when you stop caring what everybody else around you thinks? You know how awesome you would be if you would just be you and know that God made you the way you are and it's okay to be you, baby. So put your plaid pants on and smile because that's who God made you to be. You know some of you would, you don't need a prayer meeting. You don't need to have a breakthrough. You just need to be you. Because only you do you. Stop being who you think everyone else wants you to be and be you. You know how liberating that is? Be you. I could just preach on that right there. Be you. <laughs> My goodness, I see some of you so miserable half the time because you're trying to become or do something or be somebody because you think that's what everyone else you're around you. Be you. Just be you. As long as Jesus is okay with it, that's all that matters. you got one expectation to live up to. That's Jesus. If Jesus is good with it, that's okay. Because if you got a problem with it, baby, i got to be honest with you. Forgive me for saying this way. I'm probably going to offend somebody. But before I offend you, I ask you for forgiveness. I really don't care if you like my pants or not. I like them. And I'm going to wear them. They said, boy, that's a little bold, aren't you? Aren't you afraid what people are going to think? I wouldn't have wore them. And those of you that are watching online, your, your TV is not adjusting its color. Thank you. 
But you know what? Somebody, I don't know who that is today. I don't know why we got on this, but I just somebody needs to, somebody needs to hear that. Just be you. And the only person you need to worry about pleasing is Jesus. If Jesus is okay, stop worrying about everybody around you and what their opinion is or what they're going to think or how they're going to respond. You've got one person to please. You need to say, Jesus, what do you think? And if Jesus says, I love you just like you are, then stop trying to be somebody you're not. Come on, somebody. I'm teaching, but i got to preach for a minute. My goodness. You get online, you start seeing people on Instagram and Facebook, and you're like, oh, my God, i got to be like that because that's who they are. Next thing you know, you're depressed, you're frustrated, you're miserable. Just be you. So let's go back. He said, you're the light of the world, the city on the hill. Notice he referred to Jewish listeners as the light of the world. He told them that they're the light. And their light was good works that they do so others can see God more clearly for who He is. God's plan did not end with the nation of Israel because then, look, let's go to Acts chapter 2. God established a new phenomenon. Phase 3. So phase 1, He established you. He established man. He said man was going to be my physical representation. Phase 2, He said I'm going to make a nation. But phase three in Acts chapter two, he took a whole new phenomenon because phase three said, now I'm going to have a church and this church is going to show who I am. Because these are the last prophetic words. Now, what, look, some of you need to pay attention because you're going to think you know what this means. But I, I looked at this again and it's a different, it's a different light. So look, let, let's look at this again. Acts chapter one, verse eight. Acts one, word, verse eight. If you can pull it up there. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria, even in the remote part of the world. Notice this. These were prophetic words of what would happen, not a command for them to do something. Interesting. Watch this. Notice we say witnesses, because watch, this was a command of what was going to happen, not a command to do something. How do we know that? Because look at this. Some of you, I've never looked at this verse this way. But watch, we use this verse often to be a command, for a command for the church to be witnesses. When in fact, the phrase, you shall be, is indicative. Meaning it's a statement of fact, not imperative, which is a command. The language in that was not, a, was not a command, but it was a fact. Jesus was simply telling them what would happen in them and through them. Oh, you're missing it here. See, it's not what you're going to do, but when you receive the Holy Ghost, it's what's going to happen. It's not a down-the-road type thing, a command, but it's a statement of fact that it's happening. Oh, you're not getting it. See, you're not, because we look at this as, I've got to go out and do something. But he says, when you receive it, it's happened. You shall receive power to be witnesses. They're going to be his witnesses. But what is a witness? The word witness is to shed light on something so others can understand it. So who is Jesus? What has he done? A witness will shed light on that for you. So this was not a statement of command to go be a witness. Go witness. But it was a statement of fact that when you receive the power, you will become a witness. So let's look at this for a moment. This whole idea of lights in the world. God is using His church to be lights in the world, to show the world what He is like, and to be a living, visible, tangible uh, explanation of Him. So you are the light. Which means wherever you go in the world, where you live, where you work, where you play, where you see needs around you, you are designed to be a living demonstration of God to those around you. This is one of the reasons God is developing your compassion, which is that outer ring, to be more like Him. So let's go back again. This is sort of this forecasting of a future judgment. When, God, when we're talking about judgment of sheep and goats, Jesus gave this explanation, Matthew 25, verse 37. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, 
When did we see your hung you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? And when did we see you a stranger and invite you in and, or naked or clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison or come to you? The king will answer and say to them, Truly I say to you, to the extent that you did it to one of these brothers of mine, even to the least of them, you did it to me. If you read this passage, it's hard to read this passage without realizing God is passionate about being the light of the world to others around you. I, I, I think to me, again, it's observation. It's not, it's, not, it's not a judgment. It's an observation. So take it within a, with, that I'm not speaking negatively. It's just observing. But we have become so inwardly focused as, as a church. That our whole focus is to try to bring people into this versus taking Jesus out. We want to pe see people experience Jesus here versus realizing we're supposed to take Jesus out. I remember years ago hearing stories. I, was, I, was, I wasn't born most of it, and I, I was only one or uh, less than a year old during sort of the tail end of it. Some of you were there, participated, know a little more about it than I do, have memories of it. But in 1970, September 12, 1970, some of you have heard the story, uh, but Bishop and Mother Wright drove into uh, Annapolis in a Volkswagen van uh, knowing nobody. And a lot of you have told the story, and, and I'm not trying to rehash the story, I'm trying to make a point. From 1970 to 1981, 11 years, 11 years, the church went from two people that met in a home where literally as funny as it sounds, and it, uh, to me it's, it sounds funny, I'm sure it wasn't as funny then, where literally my, the bishop would preach to Mother Wright. They would have service four times a week, and he would preach to her. That had to be fun. <laughs> you better make sure you get a word from God if you're preaching to your wife. <laughs> I need to talk about being humbly submitted today. Whew. God bless the altar calls. And so this went on, but from 1970 to 1981, the bishop knows more than numbers, so I'm, I, I don't have the, the, the fine details uh, to the level he does. But basically, just in just, uh, Antioch went from two people to the end of 19, basically 1982, running on about four, four, five hundred, five hundred probably in that area. So in 11 years, from two to 500. The bishops talked about this, and um, we've had conversations of this, and, and, and it was, it's a God thing, so don't think I'm taking it as he did something wrong or they did something wrong. We've talked about some things that took place in that that were, were, were factors that contribute to this. Up to that point in time, from 1970 to 1981, uh, this church used uh, the church that Antioch West has come out of, our, our mother, used, uh, I believe it was something along the lines of 25, 30 different facilities. Somewhere like that. Um, if, with that being the case, it's hard. I, those of, some of you may have been around during that time. You almost pay attention to make sure you know where church was going to be because it was always changing. They'd get one and they'd get kicked out and go to another one and they'd outgrow it. So, you have 11, 11 years and something like 30 different facilities. 1980, 81, we had a huge influx of people. Some of you that are even here today were a part of that. And uh, from that, 1982, we began construction on the facility uh, that is still there in the Arnold area that we've come out of. And when that took place... The bishop and I, we've had this conversation. I've heard him talk to others. I believe there was a shift that took place in that period of time. Because when we were sort of a church without a home, you hear about some of the stories of these, what they did. The, the group there in that first 11 years, they were, to say radical would be sort of an understatement. They were just... 
They were crazy. I'll just put it that way. It's the best way. of it's, it's just, Let's just call it what it is. They were crazy. But they had such a fire and a fervency to take Jesus out. I remember hearing a story. He's been here before. I believe it was Ted Grossbach who's been here, and it was another, somebody else. I, 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 I may get the, the details mixed up, and they can correct me, but I believe it was Brother Grossbach and somebody else. They strapped a speaker on top of a station wagon, drove downtown Annapolis, talking in that speaker, telling people about Jesus and all that. I, I got to be honest with you, I, I'm, I'm working to get there. I'm not sure I'm there. They were fanatical, but they took Jesus out. 1982, when we built, this, we built the building, we had a home. We were now a real church. Shifted started taking place. And I've got to be honest with you. When you go from 2 to 511 years, but from, 11, from 1981 to 2018, there's not really a big difference. From 500 to maybe 800 Somewhere along the lines, you've got to look, what's changed? Again, I'm not saying anything wrong or anything. A lot of you, I mean, you could speak to this as much as I am. But if we're not careful, the attitude has come about us focusing on what happens here. So God decided, you know what? We're going to shake up the apple cart. Hey, all of you here, we're going to take you to a place, put you on some metal folding chairs, have you set up and break down, because I'm desperate for a group of people that will look beyond the walls of a church and take me out to where the people are and stop trying to pick to bring the people here. But here's the problem. When you focus on what happens here, and this becomes your focus, what happens is we lose the ability to relate to people outside of here. We do. We lose the ability to relate to them. We lose the ability to interact with people because we get so caught up into a, and I, I, we have, for lack of a better term, a church culture. And we don't relate to people and the, the, their real lives and even the people we sort of connect with. But here's the point. When you start to walk like Jesus walked and feel like Jesus felt and, and, and interact like Jesus. We talked about this Wednesday night when we were talking about some things Wednesday night to the group that was there. Jesus was labeled many things. But one of the most incredible labels Jesus took on was the fact that he was labeled a friend of sinners. But the problem with that is, is that we've been afraid of of having friendships, or can I be honest with you, let's just take it back. We haven't been afraid. Leaders have been afraid. I'm just going to call it what it is. All right? I'm going to throw myself, on, on the, on, throw myself out there. Leaders have been afraid to promote, to have friends outside of the church because if we do that, you're going to be influenced to do what they're doing. So you can't hang out with them because if you hang out with them, you're going to do the same squirrely stuff they're doing. So don't hang out with them. Hang out with church people so you can be saved. And then reach out and hand them a card. See if you can pull them in. But don't hang out with them because if you do, you're going to become like them. You know why? Because we weren't true disciples. Because you see, a true disciple is not influenced by those around them. A true disciple influences those around them. I shouldn't be influenced because I hang out with people that aren't living the life I live. I can hang out with them and love them and be with them and not be influenced by them and allow the light of Jesus Christ in me to shine on them without becoming influenced by them. Oh, we can't do that. we got to hang out. How do you think we're ever going to reach people if we can't be their friends? can we ever reach people if we can't even sit down and have a meal with them and hang out because uh, they may say a bad word. They may slip and say one of those, one of those words we can't say. Oh my goodness, my ears are burning because they're saying 
And I got to be honest with you. This is why this disciple thing is so huge. We've got to get it. Because we've got to be able to go into the world and interact with the world and love the world, but not be the world. And Jesus went in the world, loved the world, interacted with the world, but he didn't be like the world. He was a friend of sinners. He, I said this Wednesday night, forgive me for using it again, but he didn't say to Zacchaeus, hey, come down off that tree. Listen, I would come to your house, but you know, if I come to your house, it's not going to be good. First of all, people are going to think I'm backsliding. Second of all, if I come to your house, you probably have some stuff I won't agree with, so I can't participate. There's a synagogue right down the street. Let's go there and we'll talk. But he said, let's go to your house. Knowing that going to his house was going to put Jesus in a place where people were going to judge him for something that he was not. That's why, let's circle back around. If you can't be okay with being you, you're never really going to be used of God. Because God's always going to ask you to do things that others are going to question. They're going to question your motive. Well, why are you doing that? What's your, what is, you know what? Be you. If you learn to be you, then you can be used of God because God will always ask you to do things. And Jesus went to Zacchaeus' house knowing he was going to be accused. So let's look at that really quickly here. Last 10 minutes before we take a break. Look, Jesus was intentional and deliberate about the way he was a blessing to others. No strings attached. And just like he was an intentional blessing to those who were sick, demon possessed, hungry, God has designed us to be the same way. There's a story I read the other day. It was interesting. And honestly, I've got, got to be honest with you. When I read it, I was very convicted. When we, we live in a townhome neighborhood, and uh, when we first moved there, we moved in, and uh, it was sort of a, I would say, a close-knit community. But we knew everybody because everybody was sort of moving in at the same time. But now it's been about six years, close to six years, and uh, there's been a tremendous amount of turnover in the, the neighborhood. And i got to be honest with you, I don't even know barely anybody anymore. And I read this story the other day, and it put me under conviction. It was a man that uh, he, he lived in a neighborhood, and um, it was actually a new, a new development. It was a new development that was being built. And for some reason, I, don't understand, I didn't get this part of the story. There was something about the dryer plugs that was an issue. I don't know if the builder installed the wrong one. I don't know what the deal was. But, but somehow he, you had to make modifications to the dryer to get it to work. So he had done it for himself, and he was one of the first people in the neighborhood. So he went out on his own dime and purchased, I don't know how many, whatever, amount of these dryer plug adapter things that needed. And when anyone would ever move in the neighborhood, when the moving truck was there, he'd walk over with his little toolbox, his little kit, and he would say, look, my name is, I think his name was Lee. My name is Lee. I've been living in the neighborhood. He said, I would just like to help you because you're going about to run into a problem, your dryer plug. And he would say, he said, would you mind if I helped you? And they would help him. They, he would help them. He did that until he got a reputation in the neighborhood. And as they would get a reputation in the neighborhood, People begin to ask, why are you like this? Why are you the way you are? And by his acts of kindness, where he would do this, they said, why are you like this? Why are you so giving and all that? He got to share the opportunity the way he was because he was a disciple of Jesus Christ. You see, your actions speak louder than your words. It wasn't his words that made the difference. It was his actions. Peter and Paul gave the same thing about being a blessing to those around as a mark to mature Christians. Consider these words if we go back and look at uh, Paul and Galatians when he was talking about being an intentional blessing to the Galatian church in Galatians 4.15. When then is that sense of blessing you had? For I bear witness, bear you witness that if possible you would have plucked out your eyes and given them to me. Paul was telling these people that you've lost something here because there was at one point you were so giving you literally would have plucked your eye out. 
for me. But where is the blessing you enjoy? Where has it gone that you've lost this? Peter later on said, Peter 1, 3, for a Peter, 1 Peter 3 verses 8 says this, to sum up, all of you harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, and humble in spirit, not returning evil for evil or insult for insult, but giving a blessing instead. For when you were called for the very purpose that you might inherit a blessing. Notice the attitude there. Harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, humble in spirit. Those characteristics right there are so anti this world. Harmonious? Seems like a conversation nowadays should start off with, hello, I, my name is Joel. I am such and such. What, are you a Democrat or Republican? <laughs> oh, you're, you're, I can't fellowship with you because you're not the same party as me. It's almost going to get to that point where that's where, but he said you're harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, humble in spirit. Then later on, Paul wrote to the Christians in Rome and in Corinthian regarding the way to bless others when he said this, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. Lord, forgive me right now because I do not do that very well i got to be honest with you. You cut me off in traffic? I don't know. I use, I use traffic a lot. Maybe I just need to get this off my chest. I'm actually a decent driver. But it's like, you know what? You do this to me? I mean, come on. Let's be honest. No true disciple should be getting in a bickering back and forth on Facebook. <laughs> because honestly... Harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted? Guess what, folks? If you thought 2016 was rocky, 2020 is going to be fun as well. If you thought 2016 was divisive, 2020, just prepare yourself. You all know what's coming. 2020 is going to be just as, n as nutty. And if we as believers, as disciples, can't rise up, I know we all have our own passions. Some of you in here are very passionate. There's nothing wrong with passions. But if our passions are going to divide me from people, divide me from people in the body of Christ, and divide me from people in this world, then my passions don't do any good. I mean, we all, listen, my goodness, you want to start a fight? Seriously, even here, we, we all love Jesus. He's so great. We love him. Let's worship him. All I've got to do is say Donald Trump. Who likes him? Who doesn't? Next thing you know, ding, 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 ding. It's on, baby. We done lost our Jesus mojo. It's going. Well, you know what? Well, you know what? You know what? You know what? I got to be honest with you. Donald Trump's not going to save me. He thinks he might be able to too, but he's not. Jesus can save me. So I don't want something to come between you and me outside of the body of Christ or anybody else that's going to divide me because I want to live genuine, harmonious with my brothers and sisters. Honestly, when you become a believer and you're walking with Jesus, you shouldn't have a political affiliation. You've got an affiliation of a higher calling. That's to the body of Christ, heaven. Yeah, that doesn't mean you should go not go vote. Go vote. I voted. I'm not telling you who I voted for, but I voted. <laughs> I'm going to vote again. There's something wrong with us participating in our political process. But I don't believe that should divide us. And if I can't walk up to somebody because they don't agree with the candidate I like and not have a common ground... Because I've allowed all that spirit of this world junk to get into my heart. We've got to move past that. Why? Because if you think it's going to get better, you're living under a rock. It's not going to get better. Next thing you know, we're going to have people wearing red and blue to church. Because we're becoming a red nation and a blue nation. But that's not what God's called us to be. We're supposed to be a people called out of darkness 
Again, I'm not saying this. Please, don't. Some of you are getting all worked up. Well, you don't believe we should be involved. You know, worry about you. You. It's up to you. You do that. You and Jesus work that out. That's not my call. You. You figure that out. All I'm saying is, is don't let that get in your spirit to the point where it divides you from people in the body, number one, and divides you from people in this world that need Jesus. Because there's going to be a day where a Republican is going to have to win a Democrat and a Democrat is going to have to win a Republican. Why? Because in the bottom all line, we're going to stand before the Lord and he's not going to ask you, were you a donkey or an elephant? He's going to ask you, were you born in water and filled with the Spirit? That's all that matters. And i got to be honest with you, whether you're an independent, Republican, or Democrat, Jesus loves everybody. So we have to understand there's a process in this that we are called to be intentional. Notice this. We're not just called to bless others because that's just something that happens naturally. We're called to be intentionally. Say the word intentional, which means it's something I need to think about and it's something I do on purpose. It's not something, Brother Joel, that just sort of falls out by accident. But it's something that I, as I leave this room today, that in my thought process, I am thinking about how can I be a blessing to others around me? How can I be a blessing to my neighbors? How can I be a blessing to those on my job? How can I be a blessing to those where I go and I work and I play and I fellowship and I do that? How can I be a blessing? It's an intentional thing. We want it sort of just spill out of us. We're just so in love with Jesus, and we just, Jesus is so awesome, it just sort of spills out. But he's asked us to make it an intentional thing, how we interact with the world, how we love the world, how we, how we find compassions with the world. Because as we progress in our discipleship journey, as we, our heart becomes submitted, our mind is formed by the word of God, and then he begins to work on our, on our character, our will, our desires, as that happens, by progression, it causes me to want to share that with others around me intentionally, intentionally. There's an old song we used to sing. I don't remember the words of it, all of it, but the basic gist of it is, I give you Jesus. He'll be the water that you drink and never thirst again. I give you Jesus. I don't give you Antioch. I don't give you doctrine. I don't give you this or that, I give you just Jesus. If you get Jesus, you get all that. I just want to share with you Jesus. I don't want to share with you, well, this is what my church believes. This is what we believe. This is what my church does. This is how we do things. No, I give you Jesus. What I have, give I you. I give you Jesus. Would you just one time just lift your hands to the Lord. Let's just thank him right now. Say, Father, by your help and grace, Work in my life to be an intentional blessing to those around me. Work in my life, God, to be an intentional manifestation of your compassion to the world around me. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we speak these things into existence, Father. You've called us to be the light of the world. You've called us to be the light. I speak it in Jesus' name. I speak it in Jesus' name. Praise God.